meeting has begun. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Northwest Akuho First Friday webinar series. My name is Alex Maytash, and I am your co-chair for the Professional, Develop Commi Professional Development Committee in Northwest Akuho. Each month, we strive to bring our housing colleagues across the Northwest high-quality webinars that will help each of us grow professionally. This month, we are delighted to bring you the Northwest Akuho Annual Conference 2016 Best in the Northwest Conference Program winner. John, John Magnuson is a Residence Hall Coordinator at Central Washington University. Today, he will be sharing with you his presentation from the National Conference titled, Tactful Change, A Method That Works. Throughout this presentation, we invite you to interact with each other using the chat box at the bottom of your screen or on Twitter using the hashtag Northwest Akuho. With that, I'd like to turn the webinar over to John to begin his presentation. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it looks like my microphone is working, but if for whatever reason it's not, feel free just to uh, put something up in the chat box. There's a group chat, and you guys can go through there. Uh, this is uh, my first time using uh, this go-to session for uh, you know an online webinar. I'm very used to presenting in front of people, but digital is a different situation. I know that I challenged uh, Alex to try and see what we can do with the software. So. Um, We'll see how it goes, and you guys let me know if there's anything that comes in between. Um, I'm always open for questions. You guys are welcome to send through whatever you want, and we'll make it happen. But uh, first and foremost, I, I want to welcome all of you. Uh, it looks like we've got Emily, Catherine, Kyle, Laura, and Megan. I don't know if you have anyone else sitting with you guys, but if so, that's awesome. Uh, really glad. That's I'm really, really, really excited for all this. So, great. That's awesome, Laura. Um, the one thing that I don't know is I'm not sure where everybody's from. I'm presuming the Pacific Northwest, but uh, obviously it could be from all over the country. So either way, that's great. I'm originally from the Midwest. I did my bachelor's at Western Michigan University, my master's at Indiana State University. I worked for a couple years at Yale University uh, with their conference program. Uh, and then I quit that job when Central Washington uh, offered and I could not be happier. So I'm loving what's going on here. And this all has to do with a programmatic change that we made um, after my first year being here. I worked with one of my other coworkers and we decided that the programming model may not be as effective as we had needed it to be, specifically for our student development and for our student staff development. So um, that's what this is about. So let's go into it a little bit and we'll um, just get going. All right, so first and foremost, uh, I hope you may have been here before, whether you have had an idea or you have an idea currently, but the situation seems to be the same across the um, it, it seems to be some universals. So for instance, you have an idea, a revelation, or something that you want to get dramatic results. Uh, your goal is to get this into action, make it a reality, because you know that you'll have a great impact um, on campus or with whomever your target audience is. So you plan it out, you power it up, you're so thrilled, you're so excited, so you rush right into your supervisor's office or someone else's, and you say, hey, here it is. It's perfect. What do you think? But what are you told? You're told no. Or whatever you're told, you feel shattered. Uh, you were told that be, you're being hired to bring in new perspectives, new thinking, new ideas. Uh, so why aren't your ideas being accepted? Um, it's disheartening to any professional, whether new or old. And whether you like it or not, you feel like a failure. Uh, it's even harder when they feel offended that you want any current working processes to change. It's not like you're trying to say that the university is wrong, but you have an idea for how to improve. Isn't that good enough? Isn't your passion for wanting improvements to be better? Um, worse yet, you might be told, yeah, that's a great idea. We love it. We're very open to change. Uh, we just don't have time right now. So we're going to put it to the side along with all of our other good ideas that we haven't had time to implement, and we're just going to wait for it. Uh, so it's not the best, and it's not what you were looking for. and you kind of just feel sidelined. Uh, how do you approach from there? Well, you either learn that you can walk on eggshells, take your time, find the ins and outs of the university, really listen and pay attention and be careful not to cause any problems because one, you don't want to offend and two, it's not the right time yet. So you don't want to fail again and it goes completely against everything that you were told in grad school. Um, or use tact. Isaac Newton, the father of great change, you know, the one that had the apple hit him in the head and everything, we're good. He convinced the theory 
to buy, or the world to buy into a theory that had no tangible proof, could never be seen, and could only be speculated upon. It's the theory of gravity. Um, it had a great definition, and he, but he had a great definition of tact. And I kind of abridged it a little bit for this presentation. So instead of uh, it being just about making a point, I see it as the art of making a change without making enemies. So your idea is no longer an us versus them challenge, but instead a movement of encouragement and support. And this is the big piece of this entire presentation, is that idea of maintaining your bridges, working through those bridges, finding that support, and gathering those individuals to make sure that they are there with you. They're going along with you. It's not just you on your own, but you have that monumental support, and you're bringing it from stakeholders who have been there, who have that idea behind it. I was actually reevaluating my presentation recently, even rethinking through it, and one of the things that I realized was it's that idea of, of, of having your own personal, uh, oh goodness, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, gosh, I can't even think about it. There's a word, I can't even think what I'm trying to say right now, but you, you have enough built upon your, you have a, a good enough reputation that you're trusted, that no matter what, your ideas are going to be, be there. If you find professionals that have been in a university for 25, 30 years, they don't really get questioned when they have a brand new idea. Um, if you look at experts in the field, if you look at uh, a lot of these corporations that come in and that give advice and that are brought on to be consultants, uh, they're consulting because they have that expert, and you necessarily don't. And that's one of the reasons that oftentimes you're either sidelined or turned down. This is the idea that you can maintain that level of, of professionalism, that level of uh, reliability, even though you haven't necessarily built it up yet, because you can work with others to build upon it. I always laugh at these brand new businesses that are like, we have combined 60 years of experience. And it's like, no, you've been in business for six months. Um, you do have 60 years of experience in the field, but not that. And so they seem to get it, and it works out. Anyway, the goal is, again, for higher satisfaction, less relationships compromised, and many more relationships strengthened. So. Change. This is our goal. We want to make this happen. How are we going to adjust it? Well, I want you to remember one simple idea. And that's a delicious pie. Now, when we had done this in Alaska, it was just before lunch, and it was something that we wanted to make sure that people were aware of. And, or I think it was just after lunch, but people were craving sweets, so it tended to work out a little bit better. But just remember a delicious pie. I tried to look up as many pies as possible, and I got very hungry myself. So, with that, as far as what a delicious pie is, it's an acronym, and if anyone is in the nursing field, it is a completely similar acronym, but completely different in what it stands for. So um, stay away from that. It stands to assess, develop, propose, implement, and enhance. Now we'll go through each one of these on an individual basis, and I also have a handout that will work to try and get out to you all. So afterwards, if you're able to leave your email address, I'll definitely make sure it comes to you. It is not the slides. Um, there's, I think, 117 slides that we're going through. Uh, and trust me, you won't feel that way. But the handout is pretty in-depth and explains a lot more of this, um, and you're welcome to distribute as needed. So with that, again, assess, develop, propose, implement, and enhance. So the idea that you assess your community, develop your procedure, propose it, and how that comes through, then the implementation procedure, and then once we've done a, kind of another assessment while we're implementing, we enhance it. And we'll explain that in more detail. For instance, when you first go through change, this is me. I fall into this area at Central Washington University, and this is our division. Now, naturally, if I wanted to make a change happen, I would propose it to my supervisor. It would go up to their supervisor and then go up to the top. I challenge you not to do that. Uh, it's a, not, it, well, it's a typical route for change. It's not always the most effective. Instead, when I actually made this change on campus, when we changed up our programming model, um, I ended up looking for individuals all over campus that I could use or within our division that could be supportive. And this is actually what I ended up connecting with. So it just became a bigger piece. Um, your goal here, and yeah, I've got a couple cool animations, so I hope that they work out on your end. Your goal here is to not make ripples, um, or not make waves, but make a couple ripples, and that's okay. We don't need to force change down people's throats. We want to make sure that we're there. Um, one thing that I hadn't mentioned was one of the reasons that this program model was a challenge and it was something that I was worried about and I wanted to be so tactful about it was because our associate dean actually had implemented it and it had been in place for about 13 years. So whether I meant to or not, I was concerned that I was telling our associate dean that they were wrong. Um, turns out, after the fact, I've since talked to him, it's Richard DeShields, and if everyone knows Richard, he's a super awesome, amazing, very charismatic and very kind individual. And in talking with him, he, was, he explained, he said, John, I, I 
saw your proposal and I thought, yeah, it's time for change. It's time for us to think through it a little bit more. So it was great. I didn't realize that I had the support from the top and maybe I did a little bit too much work, but it was one that was worth it. And I've, uh, I've since been uh, recognized for it a couple times. So the reason that you're looking for such supportive individuals, I'm going to go back real quick. You're looking for this many individuals is because you're going to be faced with this. Now this is the time where I would normally ask the audience uh, what they believe this is, but instead I'm just going to give you the answer. But this is your red tape. This is your, and for some it feels like a red wall, a barrier that you can't overcome, that you can't go past. And everyone's always looking at the brute force way to get through it, or we, we need scissors, we need a knife, we need to cut through this. Well, I'm gonna challenge that thought process. Instead, using those resources that we just discussed, or those ones that you'll be able to find and talk to and figure out that they have a stake in it, um, they're gonna help you realize that if you zoom out a little bit, you're gonna find it to be a maze, not a wall. And they're gonna help you get through that. They're gonna help you navigate your way through it. Now, the reason that this is so important is because of what we had found. So I'm gonna bring it back to kind of our process. And I had mentioned this before, but there was a historical significance in terms of my assessment when I found out. It was the 13 year strong, it was a system, um, and it was one that, again, had been in place for a long time and that had a strong grounding. We also learned that it was a little bit too vague. Um, it allowed too much flexibility to where the student workers felt lost. Um, they, instead of challenging them just one step above where they were developmentally, we gave them a, a lot of freedom to the point where they didn't know what was happening. Um, I heard of a study where individuals are given popcorn choices, um, uh, flavoring choices, and they were given this at a movie theater. And they were given, I think, 30 different flavorings. And it ended up being, I think, I believe it was 10 to 15% of individuals ended up using the popcorn flavorings. It was almost nothing. Um, because there were, there were so many, when they cut it down to six, I think they said it was 75% or greater, actually ended up utilizing the popcorn flavorings. And it was because they were given too much. We often do this for our students. And if you look at the app store um, and you just go into looking for apps, people don't just choose apps. They want the best recommended apps. Look at yourself. Do you end up picking the top apps um, or trying to filter that down and get that to smaller information? No one likes having too much. Uh, it's, it's one of the reasons that auto malls aren't necessarily always successful. And that's why people don't necessarily shop around to different dealerships. When they get to one and it has a good deal, they tend to settle. Um, it's good for sales, but not necessarily best for what we're looking for. Um, similarly, we had an accountability system that was present, but void of, uh, or nearly void, given formal evaluations only happen once per four weeks. Um, we also learned that current professional staffs were unpredictable and overwhelming. So um, what I meant by this was we were going for our programming per week. Uh, by allowing our staff so much flexibility, instead of having a consistency to our programs across a 10 week period, we're on a quarter system, they ended up having a lot in the beginning, and then they have this lull in the middle where they got comfortable and it's okay. And then at the end, they just realized that the procrastination took over and they swamped themselves. Um, and they swamped the students and they overwhelmed the students. This is also the same thing that kind of happened with the students' academics work in terms of when professors were asking for different assignments. So on week nine, we had a major problem. So instead, we were looking for a more consistent approach. That's why we allowed it to be once per every four weeks. Um, so every four weeks, we have a 3 two, one model where our staff are required to do three community builders, two walkovers, and one program. And I'll explain that a little bit more in just a bit. Um, like I mentioned, there was some vagueness to it. And the accountability system, this was the big one, where we weren't able to hold our staff accountable for their programming. So for instance, if they didn't do any programs until the very end, the ninth week, they technically weren't going against their expectations, our formal expectations where they had a certain number of points by the end, by the end of their 10th week. We wanted that to change. Um, and then, like I said, lastly, our current staff professionals, our schedules are overwhelmed. I have met, I think, two or three professionals total in the country that are like, oh, you know what, I've got more time. You can throw more stuff on my plate. We tend to all have a little bit where we're um, overwhelmed or we just have a lot on our plates. And that's one of those things where I was having to check my programming every single day because our staff were able to input, propose, evaluate, and look for points on a daily basis. So every single day I had to dedicate time regardless of whether it happened or not because I didn't have a way of knowing. We wanted that to change. And lastly, the peer institution, so Gonzaga University, um, at another local conference or a regional conference, uh, one of our my coworkers, so the one that was helping me with this, Mr. Brad Sandifer, he actually went and brought back a lot of information. And I said, hey, this works, this is great. Let's utilize that to our benefit. And that's one of those things, again, providing that backing, that support, that ability to say, hey, I, you can trust me, I have the qualifications. 
So from that, uh, you want to provide uh, basically three parts to your piece. What we're looking for is first and foremost a solid framework. Um, inside the details can change, but the truth is the foundation should stay the same. We, you want to find that focus. And what is that focus of your entire proposal? It's your why. It's a really hard challenge and it's something that's a difficult to find and something that's difficult to get to. But if anyone's a fan of Simon Sinek, you know that it's a major benefit. It's the start with why philosophy. I don't like to read a lot of my presentation, but for this one I will, because um, this was our focus. I said our focus was on community development, strong, well-executed programs in support of the institution. Also, the proposed system provides the capacity to meet student staff where they are in terms of autonomously managing their time while aiding them in planning and thinking through their schedules. So we gave them just enough structure so that they would be able to work better with time management. What we've learned and what I've seen at multiple institutions is that new student staff struggle most with time management. Returners and those that have been in the positions for a long time are good, but first year staff struggle. So that was one of the other reasons that we did it. So we were taking so much effort to put this in. We also had one more. Our focus was on reestablishing a student per or perception of programs that are professionally planned and executed. Um, hopefully this was a positive perception, but if you notice I didn't put that word positive because we can't evaluate that. We can't guarantee that. We can't make sure that that happens. Um, it, good news is it has been. Um, but that was one of those where we, we could only or affect how they were planned and executed, but not how they were perceived. So we wanted to make sure that our goals were smart and realistic. So along with the solid framework, we're looking for strong support. Um, we want to build our sales pitch and give it to those that are affected and have them become our fans, so our best recruiters. So what I did was I really reached out to every one of these people. So you notice that this person over here, and I don't know if you guys can actually see my mouse, um, but this is our director of housing operations and marketing. They had a stake in regards to our programs for how that was happening. Our ITS, they were huge because we needed to make sure that we weren't asking anything that wasn't feasible given our current digital system. And they actually remade our digital system to allow for this to happen. So we have online um, secured database uh, through our, our, our online uh, tracking system. Um, we had a health educator because one of the questions that we wanted was we wanted to bring in more faculty members. We didn't need our students to be the experts. I don't want a student going online Googling about alcohol awareness or appropriate alcohol use on campus and then teaching it to students incorrectly. We have professionals on campus who do this as their job and they do it on a recurring annual basis. Why not have them evaluate and improve their programs and instead our student staff are just working to coordinate those events to happen in the halls. It seemed to make more sense. Um, we had our director of rights and responsibilities and health promotions to make sure that they were aware and try to figure out because they've been here for some time and they had some information. Our director of rights and responsibilities, we wanted to make sure, our assistant director, to make sure that that again was in line with what our IRs were doing, so our informational reports and what our conduct was doing and to make sure that we were addressing the correct um, responsibilities and making sure that all of that was going through. So, and then we also had a fiscal uh, assistant too. Lastly, this was hugely important, I contacted the student staff and I've since had really great turnaround from this. Our student staff are our most important audience because they're the ones on the front line that are going to continue to connect the other student staff with the proposal. You have to make sure that you have a support structure in place along with your proposal along or while you're implementing it or while you're proposing it. So what I mean by that was I sat down with these individuals for hours actually. It took a lot of time because I wanted to make sure that their concerns were addressed. Um, I didn't necessarily take all of their criticisms too hard and address everything that they wanted, but it was one where I was able to explain. And I specifically made sure to target the individuals that were very outgoing, very talkative, and tended to be the ones that influenced a lot of their peers. Um, because they were also the ones that tended to have the strongest opinions. Uh, it's a challenge. You never necessarily want to discuss it with the person that's negative. But I've also was told of a philosophy back in grad school that if you're looking to get the best perspective on anything that you're trying to do, you need to find the person with the most opposite perspective of your own because they will be the one that tends to be the most real with you and tends to be the most honest. Um, and I really appreciate that because it's one of those where you need that opposite perspective. Lawyers often do that when they're having their court cases. They think of it from the exact opposite side from their enemy. So I wanted to take it from our student staff. Not to say our student staff are enemies by any means. They're definitely advocates. And that was the best part was because I ended up presenting with some of these individuals. Um, and they really enjoyed it. Um, also, during the presentation, I validated some of the concerns that the student staff had because there were some people that were apprehensive. And just to make that statement that this is hard for you. 
and then leave it at that. Leave some silence. The student staff continued to talk from there. They continued to push forward, um, and I really enjoyed it. So lastly, we're looking to make this scalable. This is the hardest. If uh, dramatic impacts were made to your department or division, make the initiative unaffected by those impacts. So for instance, if there was a lot of money cut, if there was a lot of staff cut, so we have, um, next year we're gonna have about 90 staff members. If we were to cut that back and scale that back, what if we only had three? Is this a programmatic approach that we can do? Where instead of we're like, oh, well every hall will have 12 programs. What if you only had one staff member? Are we really gonna be asking one staff member to knock out 12 programs in a month setting or something like that? This is a really difficult piece. I feel like a lot of times people miss it. You need to make it on a per staff or per student basis, not on overall costs or overall totals. Don't start out with a $20,000 goal and then go back from there. Try to figure out why it's at $20,000. And maybe that's your scaled point, is it's $20,000 per program. Um, work from there. So this is how we got to our three, two, one philosophy. Um, which again, three community builders, two walkovers, and one formal program. Um, and I'm, I, I really wish that I had a handout in front of y'all because we've got more information about that. But again, three community builders, which are basically those interactions where we want the individuals to sit and talk with everybody to be there um, as part of that community, to have those educational conversations, but in a very informal setting. So formally proposed informal programs. Walkovers were to go to university sponsored events. We have a lot happening on campus, specifically athletics. And, uh, but as well as all these other beautiful education programs, we had, uh, a, we've actually had two people from Orange is the New Black come and stop by our university in the past two, or yeah, three years, two years now. And it's really cool, great to have those speakers come through and they're often sold out events, but we wanna make sure that our students are going to those too. So I have a couple exercises, and I'll kind of walk you through these, um, but during our presentation, we are, during the presentation in Alaska, we had given a chance for people to openly provide these, but this is some of the statements that I've heard from students. I have an idea for a spring concert for students. That was the whole proposal. There was nothing else to it. Make, it was make it happen. And the challenge with that obviously is that it's not a great proposal. <laughs> um, maybe it's that you have an idea for uh, uh, $1,000 a month to be allocated for spring concerts or per week or you want to bring three artists next summer. But it needs to be more specific. This is that SMART goal, a specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Um, so we need to bring that back and rein it in and ask those questions. Last time that, we, that I challenged a student with this, or well not last time, but the first time that I challenged a student on campus with this, uh, there was a very vocal student, but they were very upset over the fact that they weren't just instantly trusted to be allowed to do their program. Um, so this is one. We need big dining events to happen on campus for students, or more often. Um, yes? What types of events? How often? Um, what are you looking for? Like, what are those specific questions? But this isn't really a, a push one. There's no question. This sounds great. This sounds very happy. And I love the fact that people make these statements and they're very political statements that are, yeah, you'll get everybody to approve of that. Because if anyone says, no, we don't, I'm a little confused as to why, but it's one of those where most people can get behind these, but you need to have more specifics to it. Um, I believe that we should advocate $10,000 per semester towards large-scale dining events for the campus and the community as a way to engage others. And we'll sell tickets at $5 per person to help regenerate those funds. Hmm, that's a different situation. And that's one that you might get some pushback, but at the same time, you might get some support too. And that's one of those that's gonna have that big impactful change that can really happen. Um, this is my favorite one, I hear this too often. I think we ask too much of our staff. Y yep, uh, great. I, yeah, sure. I think they ask, we ask too much of everybody. Um, I'm not going to deny that, but what does that mean? And can we evaluate that? So what's the next step? And I've heard that as these were blatantly made, this was a blatantly made statement of change it. How? You know, where, where are we asking too much? How, why do you feel that way? What's going on that makes you believe that this is the case? And maybe we can implement something and it's good feedback to take, but we want to see that happen. This isn't necessarily one of those real light bulbs that's being stored off to the side, even though it could be perceived that way depending on your reaction to it. So this leads to the next piece, your proposal. Um, it's, uh, and again, I hope you guys appreciate the elegant font because it's very lovely, but it's not that type of proposal. It is definitely the proposal to get it out. It's not as emotional as the same, you know, wedding or marriage proposal, but you want to definitely put the same time and dedication in to 
the proposal. Think through all of the details um, as listed within the development. So all that stuff that we just talked about, as you're going to know them, and you're going to need to have them like the back of your hand during the proposal because you need to make sure that you are on top of your, your stuff. If any question gets asked, you need to be aware of it. Any slight falter also shows that slight falter in your plan or in your credibility. That's the word I was looking for was credibility. <laughs> so this is the plan for how you should probably go through it. Um, and this is a really strong piece, and I'm um, sorry again, this, this was in the handout, but we had, it's, it's, a, it's a staged process. If you frame your proposal in these following steps, your proposal comes through really strong. It makes sense. And it's different than how most people do it. It's also different than how most people do a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, if you notice, I didn't put objectives right off the bat. We don't do that. We're, instead, if you frame, frame it in this way, in uh, this step-by-step -step approach, it'll work really well. So first and foremost, your problem. What are you trying to get at? What is the big issue? Um, from there, move forward with your solution. We want to make sure that, and again, this isn't the objectives of it, but the actual solution. In a quick statement, what do you want to do and why? We then want you to go through the benefits. Most people do the enhancements, so they do the features. This is like selling a car. Oftentimes, they'll talk about a car and they'll be like, oh, it goes from zero to 60 in 5.2 seconds, and it has AC and Bluetooth and something, something, something. What if they talked about Bluetooth and they said, you will be able to drive your car in a safe manner while talking on the phone to your family so you can remain connected and engaged with those that you care about while not compromising the safety of those that are around you or yourself because you're an important person in this world and we want to make sure that you're here as long as possible. That's a different way to sell Bluetooth than to be like, Bluetooth, FM, XM radio. If you sell it on the benefits, it's one of those where that's what people are buying into. They're not buying into the features. They're buying into the benefits of the features. Um, then you bring in your case study and your support. You, this is where you bring in all the details. Most people go from the objective to how they found out about their objectives or how they found out about what they're moving into. And a lot of the times the actual answer to the problem is not until the end. Again, I want the, their, the solution should be proposed at the very beginning. Um, and with all of this, then you do a recap. And this is where you kind of bring it all full circle. And oftentimes this is mistaken for just the solution, but make sure that this is your recap. And from there is your call to action. But there's one key point to all of this. You can't just make a single proposal. You can't just have one general universal, which is what everyone wants to do because it's super easy and it's super simple. Instead, you need to think about it like a suit coat. So while you'd wish for one to be able to sell one suit to everyone, they all will see it differently and need different things for it to fit right. Hence why we have tailors. You are the tailor. And this is important. Watch Shark Tank. You'll see this happen all the time. People come up with one solid item. They're like, we're going to sell this. It's not going to work. You can't just sell a suit in one size. Hopefully everyone's around a 38. Hopefully that works out. No, that's not why it works. So we want to make sure that your suit fits a variety of different situations. While doing this, you also need to make sure that the timing is correct. And how will they hear it? What benefits are they going to hear? So, because they might be coming at it from a different perspective, which I love this graphic because of the fact that there's a gentleman from a formal situation to a very laid back sneakers and t-shirt. Um, and it still works out. So we want to make sure that that's the case that's happening. Now that you've got the green light, it's time to begin. Time to start making change. Your goal is to minimize these. Minimize questions. You want to make sure that those affected know exactly what is needed of them. So you want to make it as concise and clear as possible. This is the big difference between need to know information and nice to know information. You don't need to go over all of the details. You need to go over what specifically the audience needs. I want you to, I'll give you an example. Google. Google searches 30 trillion websites. This is what you see as a customer, as a consumer. This is what your proposal should look like. The, or not your proposal, this is what your implementation should look like. This is exactly what it needs to look like because it's so concise to the point, it's what they want to go over. Um, for us, this was our 3 two, one system. It was our icons and our visuals, our tracking system, and I'll show you this in just a little bit. Um, you want to mix it up. You want to make sure that it's happening. But you don't need to go through all the back end work to explain all of it. And we always fall into that trap with all the students. Yes. Ultimately, get into that in the discussion if the individual comes to you and asks more questions about it. That's fine. But what do they really need to know off the bat? And let's make sure that we can bring it down to that point because if we've all learned from student development, if you plant a seed, 
that's all it takes to implement a huge change in the individuals. So we want to take all of that, everything that you're doing to make it as simple as possible, and we want to mix it with passion. Um, Ron Clark, uh, Wussifying Education. Uh, it was a big piece that our, our department and our division took to heart this year. We want to make sure that that's not happening. If you get a chance, look it up. Um, but I was going to give you a little bit more as to what it looks like for us. Fortunately, the webcam is not the best way to do it. So I'm going to let you guys just kind of breeze through the presentation and I'll, I'll, I'll explain some of it and I will do the presentation for you. You're just not going to see me. But know that in the next little bit, I was dancing. And I'm not a good dancer. I'm a horrible dancer. But it's important to know that that was a big piece of it. So here we go. Crazy dance moves right now. That's what's happening. Woo! And just for reference, that was 60 slides in about two seconds. Awesome, Catherine. Love to hear that you're dancing. So from here, I mentioned to the students that we are going to have a great time. We're engaged. We're excited. And who's thrilled about programming? The point of that was to make sure these students were pumped, were ready to go. This is not, welcome to programming. Let's go over the specifics of a program proposal. This was, let's get going. Let's be fired up. Let's be thrilled about the impact that programming can have. And just so you all know, programming is going to be as easy as three, two, one. And again, I had them say it with me. And this time, we threw our hands up in the air, and we shouted it out together. It's as easy as three, two, one. They love the fact that we were pushing it together. Now, don't get me wrong. I got a bunch of eye rolls. And I'm pretty sure some people, if their necks weren't attached, they would have been snapping them because they were going so far in the back of their heads. But at the same time, I had smiles. And that's what we're looking for. Then we went over the detailed specifics of the different types of programs. Now, I'm going to stay on this for a second because you don't have it in front of you. But this was the big difference between our different types of programs. And I mentioned that we had done icons. So all the icons at the top, the first one is a community builder. We wanted to enhance. We wanted to engage knocking on doors. Um, it's something that's a challenge. And I'm not sure why. We're still working towards it. But knocking on doors was a challenge specifically last year. This year, it's gotten really great. We wanted it to be a simple, easy conversation with their students. We were hoping for them just to basically go to dinner. Um, and I'll explain some of the ramifications in just a little bit about what actually ended up happening. Our walkovers, like I mentioned, were campus relations driven. We wanted to make sure that that was something where we're supporting the institution and we're doing a lot of walkovers. And this was the first time that we offered for advertisements or we asked for advertisements. The university puts out its own advertisements. The staffs were to be an enhancement to those. And then finally was a program. If you notice, faculty involvement is kind of a half one. Uh, that's because we had a one faculty requirement per quarter. Now, the best part is all of these expectations were far surpassed, and I'll explain that. Um, it was a good problem to have, but it was also a challenge because I think that the staff accidentally stressed themselves out extra. Best part was all these icons were hand designed, so I made them myself. Um, they were done intentionally so that the first one looks like a hand knocking on a door. The second one looks like a little per, or like a little arrow leading a big group arrow. So it's one person walking a group over. Then I had no idea what to do for a program, so I just did a star because I said it's our bread and butter and it's our star of Res Life. Um, so it tended to work out. Now from there, we gave them some examples, and students really wanted this. And we discussed these as being great community builders. Play video games with your residents. Go and hang out. Have a study night. Play board games. Watch sports games on TVs and go to meals. We also mentioned Monday Movie Madness. It is a university-sponsored event, but it is so well attended because we do actual in-theater movies or just out-of-theater movies. Um, it's not really something that we need to continue to improve, so it didn't really count for one of those, but we enjoyed it. Next up was our walkovers. We listed a bunch of different departments that you can work with or different types of, of programs, such as career fair um, or career fairs or, or our CERC function, functions. That's our student union and recreation center. Um, so a lot of these were working out, but we also listed the RA, or RHA events, which originally counted as a very low pointed program. So when we are before we moved into our single number of programs, we had point, a point system set up. And that was one of those challenges was because why would someone do a low point program just to support RHA? Um, they, it wasn't enough for them. Same thing with the NRHH programs. Now they're going. Now they're being a part of them. And I've heard from great students that they really enjoy them because they are so easy to do. And I'm like, that's great. Let's do more of them then um, because it's exactly what we're going for. And as far as our programs, we wanted to give them a really strong example of what that program is. So hopefully you guys will be able to hear this one.
And I'll leave it at that. Uh, it's a great clip if you get a chance to watch it. One of the challenges that we had was when we were going through and discussing the different types of programs. Programs themselves seem to scare our staff a little bit, especially our new staff. They seem to have these really wide eyes, and we said it's not that challenging. We don't need you to go over the top. We just want you to put some extra effort into it. If it means turning on and off the lights, maybe that's a fun time. And the best part was we did the same thing when we first started dancing. We had one person standing over the lights, turning them on and off. And the best part was they were fluorescent bulbs, so it really did not work out that well. But we got a bunch of smiles and a bunch of laughs at it, and a lot of people seemed to catch the translation between the two of them. Um, we also mentioned that smoke bombs are not allowed in the halls, but it's a great idea for a TV show. So they really enjoyed that piece because they were pointing it out as a they need to write an IR because we discussed using smoke bombs. We said, no, that's not the case. But um, this is how we ended up doing our tracker, and this was another big push. Our student staff um, were unsure about uh, how they were going to know how many programs they were doing. Originally, it was on an individual points basis, and that was just listed up on the uh, or listed up on their website when they first logged in. One of the challenges was there wasn't a lot of peer accountability. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Love it. Um, the peer accountability was one thing that I really wanted to try and make happen. I wanted to make sure that that was going on because to get each other or get a team to push itself is huge. Um, this was an actual screenshot that we pulled partway through the quarter. What you're going to see here is this was the end of a second quarter. They're supposed to have two blue dots each four green dots, and six red dots. You'll catch that there are some people, such as this one down here, Avery, who has many more than all of that. Now, if you notice, doesn't have enough red dots, but has a bunch of blue dots. And some of them are, are grayed out because they hadn't been, they hadn't actually taken place yet. Um, what we ended up finding was that our staff just went over and above what was necessary. They really enjoyed a lot of what they were doing. This person here, Quinn, did five programs, only two community builders and one walkover. When they added that all up, it tended to work out really well, and it was good for the community. What we really saw, though, was I asked the student staff, I said, where do you see that we need to do more programming? And the one thing that they caught was here, our pillars. Um, so all of our programming was pillar-oriented, and that'll be on the handout, too. Uh, we had these pillars that were actually designed by, uh, for FYE, they were designed by a task force to make sure that they were in line with what the university wanted to get out of its programming. Our SYE, our sophomore year experience, it's a new initiative that just started a couple years ago, but it's had great success and it's improving greatly as we progress. And those learning objectives were just recently defined by the, uh, our, our new assistant director for that program. Uh, and those are also in line with the FYE program. So everything that they do, we ask which pillar does it fall under. And we noticed that in my specific area, we need to see a lot more SYE programming. Now we do have mostly freshmen within the area, but these students aren't getting the same sort of uh, engagement that they really need to. So, uh, to go with that, we have tips and tricks. And this is important, and this is just something to make sure that your, pro, or your presentation and your uh, implementation is as successful as possible. So specifically through your presentations. First and foremost, words are just words. They're not necessarily as impactful as a photo. And I always love showing that photo because it's something that whenever I show it, people tend to smile. And I don't get that when I say the word joy. I don't get a concerned look on people's face or a sense of empathy when I say sadness. But photos work. Um, the human brain actually processes images 160,000 times faster than text. 160,000 times. Use those to your advantage. Student staff connect with this, these icons, better than they do these words. Now, they use the words all the time in conversation, but they connect with the icons. They connect with this idea, and it takes time, and it takes effort, and you've got to think create creatively. So maybe your creative hat was, hasn't been on since you were an RA or since you were an RHA or an RHH. Turn it back on. Put it on. Make this stuff happen because it's the best way to connect. It's an idea of multimodal learning for those visual learners, and a lot of our students are connecting with the visual and the kinesthetic learning. Um, also, get feedback always. Even right after a meeting, as soon as the meeting's done, talk with someone, debrief it. How did that go? How did it work? What do you think worked? And in all honesty, connect with the person who was most frustrated. That's a good set, source of feedback. Um, while it might not always be what you're hoping for, if you're being open to that source uh, or that source of criticism, it's going to help incredibly and very much with the acceptance of the change. The fact that these people get to have a voice, whether or not it's being used, that's what they're looking for. Also, if this is how your PowerPoint slides look, this is how they looked about 100 years ago when they were writing them on paper and showing them. We have digital technology. 
Bullet points on a PowerPoint are bullet points to your presentation. Don't use them. It's just going to cause more issues, and people don't tend to follow along with them too well. Um, have different slides. Use more. I, I think we're, here, I'll tell you how many slides we've gone through. So far, we're at 110. We've gone through 110 slides in this presentation. It's OK to have a bunch. I also love the fact that my presentations aren't very easily distributable. <laughs> it's not useful unless I'm there. And that's the idea of a presentation. It should be a visual enhancement to what you're talking about. Lastly, we expected, oh, sorry. We expected this when it came to our community builders. We expected lots of dinners, lots of movie nights or game nights, maybe some studying. And we expected this to happen a lot because they were so easy to do. We didn't want them to be stressful or challenging or anything else. What ended up happening was this. Our student staff went above and beyond what was necessary for our community builders. They perceived hosting their own TV nights or staff discussing dinners as just being part of their job. That's just what they do. Um, they went beyond the community builders and turned them all into programs. Um, ethics conversations on good versus bad noise or uh, community hours. So we had to have those with our staff because of these. Um, I had 32 students in a lounge at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Now this is, the lounge is just above my apartment, and the feet for that was really, really, really loud. This <laughs> is my breakfast club, I love it. Um, the challenge was I had to talk to the staff and say, hey, is that something that I should have had to talk to the staff about? Because technically it's violating our hours, but it's building so much community. Where is the line? And to have the conversation is awesome. We also have our student staff and our students now hosting their own events. I had one student, he came up to me and said that he was stressed about it, the programming model. I said, well, tell me about your program. Or tell me about your, I actually said, tell me about your programming. He said, well, I'm going to be doing a World Cup soccer night where I'm going to make all these flags. We're going to hang them from the ceilings. We're going to put soccer balls everywhere. We're going to play soccer outside. And then we're going to come in and I'll have streaming different games from all over the world, all over the lounge. And we'll be watching those. Um, people can take a picture of whichever one they want. I said, that's awesome. I'm so excited about that. That's cultural development. That's really awesome to hear. And probably different languages too. He said, yeah, absolutely. The catch with that, that was his community builder. I said, what's your program? And he went into, I, I just, I don't even want to go through it. It was, it was crazy. I said, your community builder itself is an outstanding program. And I don't want you to stress yourself out by doing so many programs. We wanted you to just focus on one. And if you made that program, your job's going to be better. And we don't want your students to feel overwhelmed because that's what happened. The community builders that were so enhanced, while great for us as a department, challenged our students to feel overwhelmed by the number of opportunities and the number of things happening on a regular basis. Um, thank you, Catherine. Really appreciate it. If you uh, would like your, uh, the handout sent to you, feel free to just leave your email and I'll make sure to get that taken care of. You can either send me a private message or post it on the thing. Uh, so lastly, um, or we got just a little bit more, when we had a requirement of one professor per quarter, we ended up having, this was the top end, nine faculty show up at one program. The staff member actually originally shot for six of them and got nine to come out. The faculty have had really great engagements and we do have LLCs, so this was really, really, really impressive. Um, to follow up with that, our newest staff also exceeded all of our expectations with the programs. And I don't know if this was through role modeling or because they felt that this was necessary or what, but they went above and beyond all of theirs too and kind of took that model for what a community builder is. Um, so what I would like for you all just to remember is that when you're going through your implementation and if you respect and acknowledge a delicious pie, you will be provided the support, the insight, and encouragement needed without question, so that any change, no matter how impossible, can be achieved. That's it. All right, John, that was, that was fantastic. Uh, I, I was impressed, and I was engaged almost the entire time. Uh, just like everybody else is saying, uh, well, what John has been saying, Go ahead and write your email address in the chat box, or you can send John a private message to get that handout I've been referring to. And lastly, we did want to just thank everybody for attending today's First Friday webinar. Hope that you enjoyed your experience, and you will consider other First Friday webinars in the future. And in the, our next one is going to be on July 1st, 2016, at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, the title of that webinar is still being determined, so look for that on the Northwest Akua webpage for First Friday webinars. I can hear myself in the background. That's excellent. Uh, there are several links at the bottom of your screen. One of those links is the webinar feedback form. 
if you would like to fill that out so that we can better assess our First Friday webinars and continue to improve the professional development opportunities that Northwest Akua brings you, we would greatly appreciate that. Thank you again for joining us this morning, and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Have a great day, everybody. Hey, thanks everybody. Sorry my microphone was muted, but thank you very much. Emily, it looks like you're just the last one left, but thank you so much. Really appreciate it.